First of all, I'd like to welcome you to this Thursday, Thursday afternoon lecture. We'll begin with prayer. Gracious God, how much we need thy blessing. We rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, On this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We realize that the gates of hell are indeed arrayed against thy church. We know that Satan walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We know that he inspires certain people to attack the church. We know that there will be false teachers, just as there were false prophets in days gone by. But we pray that as individuals we will be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And we pray, too, that as churches we will be kept, kept from heresy, from false doctrine, from immorality, kept upon the foundation of Christ, kept in the word of God and in the ways of God. We pray, Lord, that thou wouldst help us to beware of the enemies of the church and enable us to recognize them and to stand against them. We pray that thou wouldst bless our lecture uh, this afternoon. Help us, Lord, in the matters that we deal with. Help us to learn, to be wise, to be perceptive, and grant, Lord, that we would know the truth and that the truth should set us free. Be with us, Lord, in all our ways and bless our meeting here today and forgive all our sins, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, the title that I've been given for the lecture today is Grievous Wolves, Knowing the Times. Grievous Wolves. Now, the term Grievous Wolves comes from Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. So we'll turn to that scripture and Acts 20, and we'll read it verse 28. Acts 20, 28. Paul is here addressing the elders of the church at Ephesus. Take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, <coughs> which he hath purchased with his own blood. For this I know, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch, and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one, night and day, with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Ephesus was a very important city in the ancient world. Paul had spent th over three years there in Ephesus. That was unusual for Paul. Normally he stayed only some weeks or months and then moved on to the next place. But Ephesus was obviously regarded as a very important center by him. For the first three months, he ministered in the tabernacle, in the, rather in the synagogue, ministered to the Jews, but then when they blasphemed and argued against um, his teaching, he separated himself and the church from the synagogue, and they met daily in the hall of Tyrannus. And we're told, Acts 19, that all Asia heard the word. People came in their crowds daily. 
People would come to the markets in uh, Ephesus and they would also come to the hall of Tyrannus. In Acts 20, Paul is traveling from Macedonia and Greece. He's going up to Jerusalem. He comes into the port of Miletus and from there he sends for the elders. He hasn't got time to go to Ephesus at this point. He sends for the elders and he addresses warnings to them. Take heed to yourselves, he says, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which is so precious to him, purchased with his own blood. After my departure, he says, I know that grievous wolves will enter in among you, tearing, devouring, not sparing the flock. The first epistle of John is generally recognized to have been written, and maybe in the first instance, to Ephesus. And in that epistle, he warns against the Gnostics with their teaching that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. He just appeared in some kind of spirit form. And so John speaks about Jesus. That which we have seen and heard, which our hands have handled, we touched him. We know that he was flesh and blood. In Revelation chapter 2, there's a letter addressed to the church at Ephesus from the Lord Jesus Christ. And their reference is made to false apostles, false apostles who um, appeared in the church at Ephesus, but they were tried and found to be liars and so rejected. We also read of the Nicolaitans. These Nicolaitans seem to have been an antinomian sect against the law of God. They too were rejected by the church at Ephesus. But sadly, we read that the church at Ephesus departed from its first love. To begin with, there was a love, a seal, an enthusiasm for the things of God, but then they departed from their first love and Christ expressed great concern and spoke about removing his candlestick from their midst. Grievous wolves attacked the church at Ephesus, and today, grievous wolves are attacking the church again. So I want us to go through some of these wolves that are attacking the church today so that we will be warned and so that we will resist and stand against those who come to devour the church. The first that I would mention is those who attack the inerrancy, infallibility, and the authority of the scriptures. For us, the Bible is foundational. It's the truth. It's the only rule that we have to direct us. It's the only sure guide. Now, in the 19th century, in Scotland, there was the Free Church of Scotland, which was formed in 1843. To begin with, it was a great church. Men like the Boners, William Cunningham, Thomas Chalmers, great men of God, great theologians, who loved the truth, were to be found in the church. But within a generation, some 25 or 30 years, there was a great departure from the faith. What happened? Well, the young men, the next generation, the most talented and the most gifted were sent to the, the universities and theological seminaries of Germany to learn from these great so-called doctors of theology 
They got their degrees and their doctorates and they came back and they began to teach in the theological colleges. And very soon, liberal teaching became rampant. To begin with, it was just things like the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. We can't really, we can't make too much of it, they would say, but uh, it does seem that Moses wasn't the author of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Despite the fact that Jesus said that Moses was the author and quoted the Mosaic writings, as did other, uh, other uh, New Testament writers, yet, no, Moses wasn't the author. So it was a little thing, Mosaic authors. We're evangelicals, we love the gospel, we preach the gospel, and they were great in their support for Moody and Sankey and the um, Arminian-type mission that was in the uh, 1870s coming into Scotland and other parts of the world, but but at the same time undermining the solid foundation of the church, built upon the truth. But if you undermine the word of God, what do you have? Man's reason? Rationalism? You trust in what the human brain thinks? Fallen man? Sinful man? We've got one guide. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be truly furnished unto all good works. All scripture is given by inspiration. It's the breath of God. It's the word of God. It is the truth. Now, sadly, these wolves which were around in the free church in the late 19th century, they're around today. Different people attacking the word of God and saying, oh, well, you can accept certain parts of it, but you can't accept it all, and you can't take this, you can't take that from the scripture. No, we must stand against all those who would attack the inspiration of the scriptures. Where do we get our doctrines? Where do we get our doctrine of justification by faith? Where do we get our doctrine of the atonement? Where do we get our doctrine of sanctification? We get it from the scriptures. So where do we get our doctrine of scripture? From the scriptures. And the scriptures tell us that the word of, that the Bible is the word of God. It is God breathed. Therefore, we stand on it and hold to it and the Bible will stand when all its critics have passed away. So that's one. A second area of attack is the atonement. It was also attacked in the 19th century free church. And it's still been attacked today. The, the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement. Jesus took our sins and suffered our hell to give us heaven. Steve Chalk, he says, this is cosmic child abuse, the idea that God would be abusing his son, punishing his son for our sins. Notice how they're attacking this central, fundamental doctrine. There's few other doctrines so important as this. You could say indeed that it's the, the foundational doctrine of our Christianity. It's there right from the beginning. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain when he came with an animal and shed its blood. Death for life. You see it all the way down through the Old Testament, all these sacrifices, these rivers of blood that were shed, and they're all pointing in one direction, to Calvary, to the Son of God. How did John the Baptist announce his coming? 
He said, Behold the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb. That's vital. He took our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He suffered our hell to give us heaven. That's fundamental. Beware of the grievous wolves who are attacking the substitutionary atonement. A third attack is to do with justification by faith alone. It's so vital, so central, so fundamental. Remember Luther? Here we are 500 years after the, um, Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg. Remember Luther on his knees in Rome, climbing up St. Peter's stair, trying to earn merit, trying to earn salvation for himself, aware of his sins, conscious of his guilt, punishing his body. And halfway up, he hears God's word in his heart. The just shall live by faith. And he jumps up. No, it's faith alone. Not works. We can't be saved by good works. Neither is it faith plus works. A little bit of our effort and a bit of God's. No, it's faith alone. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The work of Christ is the ground of our salvation and faith is the instrument by which we receive justification. We receive Christ's atoning work by faith. But then you get N.T. Wright and others. I remember meeting N.T. Wright at the first Banner of Truth Youth Conference way back in the early 70s. Since then, his views have changed so much, so much. Now he's talking about this new perspective on Paul. Jewish religion was not a religion of works. The Pharisees, they, they believed in grace as well as works. So justification by faith alone, well, that's for the Gentiles, and it's a kind of boundary marker, sort of uh, describing who belongs to the church. The, the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. The Jews saved through their way, through their Jewish ways, and the Gentiles saved through their Gentile ways. How wrong. Attacking this fundamental doctrine. Again, what can be more central than justification by faith alone? Remember how Jesus spoke about the Pharisee and the publican going up to the temple to worship. The Pharisee, a religion of grace, was it? I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Look at me, Lord. See what a good person I am. Think of all the good works that I do. And the other man, he cried out, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And he went to his house justified. Jesus teaches us quite clearly justification is by faith alone. It's fundamental. Beware of the wolves that are coming in to destroy and to devour. Next one that I would mention is the doctrine of hell and everlasting punishment. Nowadays, there are various attacks upon it. The 
teaching of conditional immortality. People like John Stott, such a, a famous evangelical Anglican, and Philip Hughes, coming again with rationalistic arguments. Man's reason as over against scripture. God is a God of love. Can you, could you possibly imagine a God of love punishing people forever in hell? Surely a God of love could never do that. Notice human reason coming to the scriptures, not taking the word of God, not taking the teaching of Jesus when he speaks of that place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, the bottomless pit, everlasting punishment, but using man's reason. Man's reason is over against scripture. Immortality. Well, immortality only belongs to God. And those who believe in Jesus, through faith in Jesus, they, they live forever. But, but the wicked, they're not immortal. After they've been punished, they just disappear, annihilated. That's their teaching. But it's not scriptural teaching. Scripture speaks of everlasting life and everlasting destruction. And the same word, the same Greek word that's used for both, everlasting life and everlasting punishment. Hell is a place of everlasting punishment. People don't realize, none of us, even the most enlightened of us, can grasp how awful one sin is. One sin deserves eternal hell. Can we see it? Can we grasp it? No, we can't. Because God is infinitely holy, and you and I are such sinners, and so limited in our understanding. But if we could see the wickedness of one sin against an infinitely good God, we would see that even one sin deserves an eternity in hell. Because God is infinitely holy and infinitely good. It's infinitely wicked, boundlessly wicked, to sin against God. Hell is forever. That's why the scripture is so strong and Christ is so strong. And flee from the wrath to come. Prepare to meet your God. Make sure you're a Christian. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, because there's no second chances. So there's those then who attack the doctrine of hell. A fifth area of attack is new covenant theology. The Ten Commandments, they belong to the old covenant. Christ fulfilled the old covenant. It's all passed away. And we are now those who are under grace, under the new covenant, under the law of Christ. And there's a failure to see that really there's only one kind of morality. God doesn't change. You don't have one God in the Old Testament and another God in the New. It is the one God who is infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. This great God, he's holy. He doesn't change. His law is holy. It doesn't change. The moral law of God is there from the beginning, and God demands from us holiness. Oh, you're just a legalist. Well, what's a legalist? A legalist is somebody who trusts in keeping the law to earn heaven. We don't believe in that. We're saved by grace. But being saved by grace, being justified by faith, we believe it's very important to be holy. And we show that we are justified by living holy lives. Show and demonstrate that you are born again by the way you live. Don't wallow in sin. 
New Covenant theology, undermining the law of God, undermining the holiness of God, undermining the justice of God. There's one covenant of grace, one way of salvation, one church in the Old Testament and in the New, one moral law, one standard of holiness. Sixthly, the Sabbath. It follows on really from New Covenant theology because those who believe in this New Covenant theology, they tend to attack the Sabbath. And there's others, of course, who attack the Sabbath too. But the Sabbath is so important. That one day in seven, important for our bodies to get rest from the work of the week, important for our minds to get rest from the strains of the week, but most important for our souls, spiritual rest. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, a holy day, a day for spiritual things, the market day of the soul, the day when most people are converted, the day when God's people are edified and strengthened and built up in their faith. God gave the Sabbath in the Garden of Eden before the fall, when man was perfect. And if man in perfection needed a Sabbath, how much more Man in his sinful condition today, you and me, need a Sabbath. Of course we need the Sabbath. Because we're so worldly. And we're so easily drowned in the cares and the pleasures of the world. We need the Sabbath. And if the Sabbath was instituted as it is, in Genesis chapter 2, before the fall, how could the redemption of Christ, the death of Christ, get rid of the Sabbath. Why should it? How could it? If it was necessary in our unfallen state, surely it's necessary for us today. And Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man. It's for your good and my good. The Sabbath was made for man. He said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath the Lord's day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. When the church is at its healthiest, it keeps the Sabbath carefully. Wolves are coming in trying to steal your Sabbath. Don't let them. Treasure the Sabbath day. Treasure it. It's a blessing, a great blessing to your soul. Next, antinomianism. We mentioned the Nicolaitans, Revelations 2 and 3, earlier on. Paul speaks of those who are saying, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Today you get those who talk about grace Amazing grace, God's super amazing grace. God's grace is so wonderful. You shouldn't be troubled about sin. You shouldn't feel guilty. You shouldn't feel bothered. You shouldn't be anxious at all about it. You're forgiven. You're justified. All your sins are forgiven. Don't worry. Sin boldly. I remember a minister preaching on this, sin boldly. Quotation from Luther. We shouldn't take everything that Luther says as gospel truth. And Luther could mean it in a different way from the way it seems this minister was meaning it. Sin boldly. When you sin, don't let it take your boldness away from you. Go on. You sin, but oh well, we all sin, but God's grace forgives you, and it's fine. Rejoice, be happy. No, 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 no. Blessed are the poor in spirit. 
the broken and the contrite heart. Blessed are they that mourn. Godly sorrow that worketh repentance not to be repented of. The sorrow of the world works death, but godly sorrow. We need godly sorrow when we sin. We must hate sin. When we sin, we must repent of it. There's not much emphasis on repentance these days, but repentance is vital. You look through the sermons in the book of Acts. Repent, repent, repent. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be converted. God calleth upon all men everywhere to repent. Where's the emphasis upon repentance? We must stress sin. We must stress repentance. And repentance is something which we are to be doing daily as Christians. We must hate sin and repent of it and love the law of God and walk in his ways. Sin boldly. You watch a bit of pornography, don't worry about it. You maybe feel a wee bit guilty, you shouldn't really worry about it. Drop into a little bit of immorality, well, God forgives you, it's fine. Go on, you're okay. How wicked. Straight from the devil, the doctrine of hell. Beware of these grievous wolves that come in. Antinomianism. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my study all the day. It makes me wise. It's a light to my feet, a lamp to my path. Love the law of God and hate sin. Remember, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Be holy, for I am holy. Holiness is so important. Antinomianism then, that's another of these wolves. Another problem area is women in the leadership of the church, in the eldership and in the ministry. It seems so reasonable today, doesn't it? We have women in prominent places in industry and we have a woman prime minister, a woman as first minister in Scotland, and a woman as our queen. And women are just as gifted as men. Yes, of course they are. It seems crazy to keep them out of the ministry. They could do such a good job. There's many a woman could preach a far better sermon than men. Could be better pastors, no doubt. But that's not the question. It's not our reasoning or our culture as over against Scripture. It's what saith the Lord. What does God say? I suffer not a woman to teach or to usurp authority over a man. Let your women keep silence in the churches. That's the teaching of Scripture. Well, that's just Paul. It's culturally, culturally conditioned. It's just the way they were at that time. It wasn't allowable for a woman to teach in, in these days, but today is different. We live in a different culture. Well, when Paul is arguing about these things, he doesn't believe base his argument upon culture. He bases it upon Scripture, upon God's Word. I suffer not a woman to teach or usurp authority over a man, for, he says, Adam, 1, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Adam was first created, then Eve. So it's based on creation. Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Again, it's based upon the fall, upon these not culturally conditioned ideas, but truths from the very beginning. So when it comes to leading and worship, and the appointment of deacons and elders and ministers, 
It's men that are to be in these positions because God has said that. In one sense, yes, we're all equal. In Jesus Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female. Ontologically, essentially, men and women are equal, equally children of God and equally heirs of heaven. But God has placed men in a position of leadership in the church. And he's given to men the duty of teaching in the church and not to women. And we have to recognize God's authority, God's word. We must subject ourselves to his authority. And once people start bringing in women leaders into the church, it undermines the authority of scripture and other things follow. That's what happened in the Church of Scotland. Women elders and ministers coming in in the uh, 1960s, 70s. And what has it led to? Next problem area, homosexual ministers. Well, we live in a society which accepts homosexual behavior. Some poor people, that's the way they are. They're just, they're homosexuals, they can't help it. Should we deny them the right to marry? Should we deny them the positions of leadership in the church, membership and leadership? It's just the way they are. God created them in that way. Our culture says it's fine. There's no problem. But what says scripture? It says it's an abomination for a man to lie with a man as he would lie with a woman. Leviticus chapter 20. It's an abomination. It's wrong. It's sinful. It's against God's law. God's law is there and it sets down the boundaries. And we are to keep to the boundaries that God gives us. We are to follow what he teaches us. Culture changes. And culture, when it's not influenced by scripture, what happens? It becomes an immoral culture. Some cultures have been cannibalistic. Would that be right to allow cannibalism? Of course not. The fact that culture is ungodly means that we have to seek to bring our culture under the judgment of God's word. And we should, be always, we should always be trying to reform our culture and make it a Christian culture. People often make excuses for their African culture or their Islamic culture or whatever it is for breaking the word of God. But culture is not the rule. Scripture is the rule. Culture is challenged by the word of God and the law of God. And culture has to be brought under the word of God. We obey scripture. Now there are those, and they will argue, oh, but, you know, in the scriptures, you can interpret the scriptures in another way. Sodomy, what was the problem in sodomy? It was homosexual rape. It was forced homosexuality. That was a problem. No, it's laid down quite clearly for us, Leviticus 20, 13, that homosexual sex is wrong. Romans 1 also makes plain that homosexuality and lesbianism is in fact a judgment of the Lord because of ungodliness, idolatry, and turning away from the ways of God. This comes down as a judgment upon people. But sadly, as I said, say, for example, in the Church of Scotland, they accepted women into the ministry, and now, as you know, they have accepted homosexual ministers, ministers who practice homosexuality. And God's law is trampled underfoot. Another area is the denial 
of six-day creation. You read Genesis, and it's so plain that it's history. God created the world in six days. It's there for us, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. It's there plainly for us. But atheistic science, it says, no. The world came into existence. This earth, what, um, 4,500 4, million years ago, the universe came into existence with a big bang. 13 Point five billion years ago. But the scripture is God's word. It is truth. People say, oh yes, but Genesis chapter 1 is just um, symbolical language. and It's just uh, poetical language. It's presented as history, but it's really just a sort of framework and a a kind of symbolical way of looking at things. Well, when God spoke, when God spoke on Mount Sinai, and all Israel heard God's voice, not Moses' voice, but God's voice, what did he say? Amongst what he said was the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days God made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is. Wherefore God blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Fourth commandment grounded upon the six day creation. God said it. Was God telling lies? Was God deceiving people? God is truth. He's the God who cannot lie. And he told us that in six days he made heaven and earth. So we follow a six-day creation. And science will come and go. And it'll come with its various theories and ideas. But eventually science will discover that the world was indeed created in six days. And science will discover that it was created only a few thousand years ago, not billions of years ago. We're not frightened of science. Good science is good, where people properly interpret the facts and not come in with their own atheistic ideas. Another area is the preservation of the scriptures. God gave us the scriptures. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Spirit. They wrote under the direction of the Spirit. And then the word of God having been written, God has looked after it and preserved it for 2,000 years. In the 19th century, you got Westcott and Hort coming along. And they said, well, you know, the way books are passed down, errors are made here and errors are made there, and scribes change this and they change that, and we can never get to the autographs, the, the original manuscript which was written, but we can try and reason and we'll get somewhere near it. And so the oddest, the oddest readings, the oddest manuscripts are likely to be the most genuine. And so, for example, if you follow these modern versions and uh, that critical text, Mark's gospel ends at Mark 16, verse 8. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Can you imagine Mark finishing his gospel with fear and with doubt and with despair? 
writing many years after the resurrection. How crazy! But that's human reason set against Scripture, set against the Word of God. God has preserved His Word. The majority of manuscripts all directing us in a certain way. We don't go with these odd, unusual manuscripts, but we rather stick with the majority as God has preserved his word for us. The received text used at the time of the Reformation and on to the present day. God preserves his scripture But the devil likes to cast doubts upon the word of God. Grievous wolves seeking to undermine the authority of the word. We stick by the word of God that has been preserved for us. Another problem area is very common today. Comparative religions. All religions have some truth in them. And as long as people are sincere, they all lead us to God. Surely you can't say that the 1,500 million Muslims in the world are all going to hell. I remember lecturing in Africa and Kenya and a man said to me, but surely... Surely all my forebears aren't in hell. Well, that's man's reason against Scripture. What saith the Scriptures? Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no woman, no child, no man cometh unto the Father but by me Jesus I am the door the only door the rest are thieves and robbers who try and get over the wall he's the door by me if any man enter in he shall go in and out and find pasture I am the door Jesus is the way there is none other name given under heaven among men through whom we must be saved there's one true God one true Savior, one true way of salvation, and only one way to be saved, a narrow road that leads to heaven. All religions are wrong, but the true Christian religion. And then linked to that and developing from that is the ecumenical movement. We're all Christians. We all believe in the Apostles' Creed and we all hold to the doctrine of the Trinity. So there's an evangelical wing of the church and there's a liberal wing and there's a neo-orthodox group and then there's the sacramental folk, the high church people. We're all Christians. Different ways of looking at things, but we're all Christians. We're all brothers and sisters. And we're all going to heaven. No, not at all. There's false doctrine around. There are many who call themselves Christians and they're not true Christians. They're not born again Christians. They're not justified by faith. They're looking for justification by their good works or justification by being baptized. They think because they're baptized, they're saved. Or because they take communion, they're saved. Or because they're members of the church, they're saved. No. The only way of salvation is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. No other way. What must I do to be saved? Believe. That's the only way. There's no other way by which we can be saved. And so these various wings of the church These various groupings, as it were, calling themselves Christians. They're not Christians. The Roman Catholic Church, which teaches salvation by worshipping the wafer, by trusting the Pope and the Church, 
What are they doing? Leading millions and billions to hell. They're not Christians. If people are trusting in the wafer, and if they're praying to and trusting in the Virgin Mary and the saints, rather than trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're the anti-church and the anti-Christ. They're the Babylon, not the New Jerusalem. There's only one way of salvation. The evangelical gospel. Jesus Christ dying for our sins. Faith in him. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. A person can call themselves a Christian. They can say that they believe in the Trinity and that they believe in the Apostles' Creed and all the rest of it. But if they're not born again, they won't get into heaven. Beware of the ecumenical wolves. Another area, problem area, is entertainment worship. The rule in many churches today is, what do we enjoy? What makes me feel good? What can the outsider enter into and feel at home with? What is successful? You get a abandon and all this modern music, contemporary music, and you, you do things well and you advertise it well and you build up a big church and you have thousands of people in your church and it's wonderful. But is it? Is that what God wants? How are we to worship God? Is it a matter of what I think would be good or what you think would be good? Where does the Bible come in? We are to worship God as God himself lays down. See thou do all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. We're not to come with our images and our idols and our pictures and our crosses and crucifixes. Thou shalt, second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them or serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. I'm jealous for my glory. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God is a holy God, and he says how he is to be worshipped. It's not our rationality, our feelings, our emotions. The rule is God's word. When Nadab and Abihu came with their offering before the Lord, he struck them down dead because they came with strange fire. It hadn't been commanded. They were killed. God's judgment upon false worship. We are to worship God with awe and with reverence and with respect. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Angels veiling their faces in his presence. Another area is pretended miracles. Folk who go around claiming that they have the gift of healing. They lay hands on others and pray for them and claim that they're able to heal them. And if the person is not healed, the reason is your unbelief. Not my gift or lack of it, but your unbelief. So wrong. Conning people. 
deceiving people. You don't see them attempting to heal children with Down syndrome, do you? You don't see them giving legs to people who don't have legs or people with withered hands and arms being healed. You don't see people who are born blind receiving their sight, do you? It's more mind over matter. It's all just human persuasion. Pretending. Conning. Now, of course, we do believe that God can heal the sick. And we do believe in miracles. Yes, God is able to do anything. There is no limit to his power. And that's why we pray for those who are sick. And we look to the Lord if it is his will to heal them. Yes, we believe in God's almighty power. But we also know that the gift, the gift of healing passed away with the apostles and the early church. It passed away. And those who claim to have it today are con men. Beware of the wolves. And closely linked to this is the money makers who are making themselves fantastically rich at the expense of gullible individuals. Those TV evangelists, pay your money to us. We'll heal you. We'll make you rich and successful. Come to us. Give us your money. And whatever you give to us, it will be multiplied a hundredfold. We need money for for our TV station. We need money for our aircrafts to take us around the world and healing missions. Come give us your money. And these guys, they become, and women, they become fantastically wealthy. And they have this prosperity gospel, health and wealth gospel. It's so wicked. It's so contrary to the scripture. Jesus means you to be happy. Jesus means you to be healthy. Jesus means you to be wealthy. Where does it say that in the Bible? Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Rejoice in tribulation, says Paul. For tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost to me hath given unto you. No. Pain and suffering and illness and poverty are all part of God's plan for us at times. There is a verse which says, I have been young and now am old, and yet have I never seen the just man left, or that his seed for bread have beggars been. Psalm 37. God's people won't be left in beggary. He will feed them. He will care for them. But they might have many a worry and many a trouble in this life. Sickness is part of a cursed world and death is part of that world too. These money makers, they were around in Paul's day, he spoke about those for whom gain was godliness. Making gain, making Gain out of godliness. Beware of these wolves. And related to that are the false prophets. There were false prophets in the Old Testament, and there are false prophets today. Those who claim to have a word from God, who claim to have divine inspiration, and to be able to speak forth and to tell the future. But they're deceivers. They're liars. They're making it up. They're getting a hunch for something. Or they're being led by the devil. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past to our fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. The final, definitive, New Testament revelation. 
Scripture is sufficient. And those who claim to be prophets, you know what happened to prophets in the Old Testament who prophesied things and it didn't come true? They were stoned to death. That's what should be done with the false prophets today who come round saying, saying this is going to happen and that's going to happen and it doesn't happen. False prophets, liars speaking in the name of the Lord to deceive people. Then another wolf, as it were. Those who deny the equality of the Son of God with the Father. A young man came along to my church recently and uh, we were very pleased to see him. He had no background whatsoever from a rough background. But the next thing we realized was that he was getting his theology from the internet. And before long, he was denying the deity of Christ. And he's so firm in his views. He's been getting these ideas on the internet, so determined, holding on to them. Beware of the wolves, those who are saying, that Jesus is not equal with God. Jesus is Jehovah. He is the great I am. Before Abraham was, I am. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He is not created. He is the creator. Without him was not anything made that was made. And then you get those today like Wayne Grudem and Bruce Ware who speak of the eternal submission of the Son to the Father. The early church struggled, struggled so long, trying to work out sound doctrine and they came up with these early creeds and the Lord was guiding them in these things you get these guys today who are trying to be so original trying to come up with new ideas beware of new ideas Spurgeon was one who said I've got no new ideas he had the gospel that's what we have to have the old old truth of the gospel Beware of those who come with their new ideas. And one final error. I touched on it last night. Those who say today, and it's quite common, it didn't used to be common, but it's very common today. People who go around from church to church, and they're not a member of any church. Oh, we're members of the Church of Christ. We're believers. We're saved but they won't submit themselves to be members of a local church. That's dangerous. Why did God give us elders? Why are they there to be found in the scriptures, appointing elders over every church? They're there in order to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. They're there in order to discipline, to watch over and care for the souls of people. Oh, but there's people and they say, well, I had a bad experience with elders and so I'm not going to join any church. And they're a law unto themselves. But that's dangerous. God has given us the church. And we are to be members of the church. And we are to be under the discipline of the church. And it's there for our building up and our edification. It's our rejection of Christ's authority. So then, today, I've come to you with wolves. A pack of 20 wolves. Attacking the infallibility of the scriptures, the inerrancy of scripture. Attacking the atonement, attacking justification by faith alone, attacking hell, 
everlasting hell, new covenant theology, attacking the Sabbath, antinomianism, women in leadership, homosexual ministers, denial of six-day creation, denying the preservation of the scripture and manuscripts. All religions have some truth in them. They're all leading to heaven. The ecumenical movement, entertainment worship, pretended miracles, those who are making money out of the church of Christ, false prophets, those who deny the equality of the Son, and those who see no need to be members of the church. There are other wolves, grievous wolves. For I know that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch. And remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank thee that thou hast given to us thy word, that sure, certain word of God, that firm, steady foundation, the scriptures which cannot be broken. Grant, Lord, that we would love the truth, walk in the truth, delight in the truth, and help us to beware of all these wolves that seek to devour the church of God. Deliver us, O Lord, from Satan and all his devices. And may we be kept, kept in the way and kept by God, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Forgive us for all our sins and all our wanderings, for Jesus' sake.